And we are back here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. I'm Derek Rackley. He's Dave Archer. No DJ Shockley this week, but he will be back in studio with us next week to break down all things Atlanta Falcons. And by the way, thanks for joining us on AtlantaFalcons.com, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you end up getting your podcasts. We're going to jump right into it. First, let's talk about what we're going to be on let's, the rundown, the agenda for today, Dave. Uh, quick reactions like we do pretty much every week to the game last weekend against Buffalo. Of course, Atlanta Falcons come up short 29 to 15. One topic that I didn't think we'd ever get a chance to discuss in Matt Ryan and taunting. Yeah. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. Uh, Falcons defense continues to take the football away. Are they becoming an elite defensive turnover unit? We'll discuss that. Current status and lasting impression of this team, as we do know, unfortunately, the Falcons were officially eliminated from postseason contention. And then we will talk about whether or not the Falcons will ruin the new year for the New Orleans Saints. If there's one thing that you can have at the end of the season, Arch, especially when you're eliminated from the playoffs, it's a game against the Saints, right? Because it's like there's no reason to, to try to give the guys motivation to get up. They'll get up for the Saints game no matter what's going on. Yeah, you can bet these two fan bases will be jacked up too as well. <laughs> we get an opportunity to leave a dead fish in their back seat is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's really kind of one of those stank face. <laughs> dead fish in the back seat. All right, before we get to the Saints, let's talk about last weekend. Arch, you were there. First of all, before we get into quick reactions, let me just ask you this question. Tell me about the conditions. For the people that were watching it on television, how was it like there? Yeah, it was chilly. It was chilly. I think we saw it from the pass catchers, right? Especially yeah. with uh, some of the balls thrown. Both sides are having a tough time squeezing the ball with yeah. their fingers. That came, it kind of gave you an idea that if you had some of your, your smaller appendages were, were affected by the weather. Uh, the snow on the field was a little bit choppy. It was probably about an inch on the field, so yeah. that wasn't significant. It looked like footing was okay. It didn't mm -hmm. look like it was it was severe in any way. I, I walked around the field. It didn't seem like it was that big a deal. But uh, it, it there was a wind that always blows in Buffalo. I know yeah. you've been up there that kind of swirls around that stadium, and the wind is cold. That wind feels like it's blowing <laughs> off a glacier. And yeah. so that if there wasn't any wind, it kind of was that 29, 30 degree day. But with the wind blowing, that changed the dynamic. We're uh, we're watching the game, and it's interesting. You probably played up there. I actually played in Buffalo that I remember one time, Arch, and I can't remember if you were on the call at that time, but we played them the first game of the year. It was like 87 degrees. And somehow in eight years in the NFL, I escaped having to go to <laughs> Buffalo with – conditions like last Sunday or lake effect snow. I was trying to describe to my daughter what lake effect snow is in Buffalo and how nasty it can be was not like that last weekend. But let's talk about what are your quick reactions to what happened in the game last weekend. Atlanta Falcons looked like they were in a driver's seat and then things just kind of fell off in the second half. Yeah, I, I thought that there were there were it was an ebb and flow game much like a lot of the Falcon games have been this year where there's been a big swing in things. Opening kickoff, you got an opportunity to potentially fall in the football at the one yard line, I thought we missed an opportunity. It looked like Michael Walker might have had a chance to recover it there uh, on that on that on that initial uh, opportunity from a special team standpoint. Uh, Avery Williams gets to hit ball in the end zone. You get the safety. So excellent job of providing a little bit of momentum to start yeah. the game, mm -hmm. and then it kind of didn't really go anywhere. And, and and they started to get a little bit of foothold. By the way, Josh Allen can spin the football now. <laughs> Dude can throw it. He made some throws in the wind that were mind boggling. But what jumped out to me was the defense's resilience against a pretty formidable offensive unit, and it played really well coming in. Um, they were able to kind of keep that same momentum of bend, 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 but don't break. And they got a turnover down there late in, in the first half with the with the Duran Harmon interception. Yep. Three consecutive takeaways. I know we're going to talk about that. So I thought that that, that mentality seems to be kind of taking shape a little bit. Like to be a little bit more resistant against the run, which yeah. we were not. Yeah. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, it's still kind of a mixed bag for me. You'll get moments where you run the ball with a lot of effectiveness, and then you'll play action off of it. But then if you're forced to throw it, we don't seem to be able to protect consistently. Yeah. And so the consistency on the offense is not there yet. And so those are my takeaways. The thing that you do get in Arthur Smith, and this is, re this is uh, resounding, these guys play for 60 minutes. Yeah. It's yeah. not one of these kind of deals where, oh, here we go, we're done. No. They play you to the wall all the way through. And if the thing hadn't happened to Ryan and we got the touchdown there, which you thought, 
you got a one-score game with about seven minutes to go in the yeah. game, and yeah. I think Buffalo's in a real dogfight down the stretch. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into that again as well, and it's it's interesting to me, Dave, because you get three turnovers playing on the road in bad conditions, and you're thinking as a visiting team, that sets up pretty well for you. Then you, and I, I wouldn't say then you, but rewind back to the opening play where they're able to get the safety and get the football back right away. So there's a lot of moments that you can point to that sets up perfectly for a visiting team to go get a victory, right? But the things that kind of stick out to me other than some of the missed opportunities you talked about, third down conversions, one. Red zone conversions, one. It's going to be hard to win in the National Football League when you can't extend drives and you can't punch it in in the red zone. And I, look, I know this is Atlanta Falcons audible, but you bring up a good point, Dave, about Josh Allen. Though I didn't get a chance to watch him much this year, but after watching that game, that kid's compete level is impressive. Uh, and we talked about the the difficulties Atlanta has at times slowing down a running quarterback. Well, he's not only a running quarterback, but he runs with physicality. I mean, there was the stiff arm that he had. I can't remember exactly who it was on. Dante Fowler. That was that was pretty impressive. That's a defensive end, yeah. outside line pass rusher that a quarterback is stiff arming. Because that's probably a moment that he's not going to want to watch on the tape. <laughs> no. um, but his ability to run the ball, but like his compete level, that's just what stuck out to me. It wasn't so much that, oh, nice job picking up the first down. It's just his mentality is like, we're not going to end this drive. Like, we're going to pick up a first down. Not to say that we need to be like that, that Matt Ryan needs to be like that. That's not his game. But that's one thing that I came away with is that his compete level is pretty strong. And I, I have a better appreciation for him as a starting quarterback in the NFL. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So, Dave, you kind of talked about it. Matt Ryan, huge turning point in the game. Scrambles, looks as if he gets into the end zone for a touchdown. The play gets reviewed. However, there's a taunting penalty on it, which was likely just going to end up being on the kick. Play gets reviewed. Knee is down, short of the goal line. So instead of touchdown, and we'll just mark it off on the extra point, it gets moved back and no touchdown, and of course Atlanta does not end up taking advantage. Talk us through like what was going wow. through your mind in that whole scenario. Well, the first part of it is you think Matt makes a play, gets in the end zone, certainly looked like it. And and my thought on the rule was if he goes forward, he's a runner. If he doesn't slide, he's not giving himself up. He's yep. just diving, yep. that he has to be touched down. That's not the rule. It doesn't matter whether you're a quarterback or a runner. If you physically give yourself up, which he essentially was going to the ground, then you mark the ball where his knee touches the ground. And so the mark was correct yep. at the one yep. half yard line. Okay. Matt thinks he scores. Well, Jordan Poyer comes over and spears him as he's in the end zone. Ryan gets up, spikes the ball in his face. It's a taunting. It, by the definition Correct. of the rule, it's a taunt. He spiked the ball right in his face and yelled at him. An official was standing right there. He flagged it. The problem with that is, is he misses the other call. The other call is the illegal hit on a player that had given themselves up. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a running back, wide receiver. Doesn't, if you give yourself up like that, you can't, as a defender, go to the ground and spear them in the back. That's a personal foul penalty. So what should have happened there is Ryan still gets the penalty, but the personal foul penalty, they're both dead ball fouls. They offset one another. You go with the play, and the play is on the one-foot line, right. third and goal. Right. Instead, they miss the hit on Ryan. They flag Ryan for, for the, um, the uh, whatever you call it. Uh, taunting. Ta the taunting yeah. or whatever it is. And they move him back. Now they move the back. It's now third and goal from the 16-yard line. <laughs> yeah. And so that changes everything. They tried to take a couple shots at the end zone. It didn't work out. So a completely blown situation there yeah. by the official. They got the first and the third part of it. They missed the middle part of it, which would have been the roughing call on Ryan, as it turns out. That was a big point in the game. I don't know if that – I don't think that was the turning point in the game, okay? Uh, we we're talking turning points in games. I thought the takeaway by Foye Luokin at the start of the first half yeah. – 
or second half. Yeah, third was the quarter. third consecutive ter- turnover by Josh Allen. If you turn that into points, you score. Now you've scored anywhere from 16 to 20 points on three consecutive takeaways. Yep. You have seized control of the game, and now Buffalo's reeling a little bit. Now they might come back and score, but you're talking about jockeying down to the end in a one score, maybe a one uh, field goal type football game. I thought that was a key moment for me was not cashing in the foyer looking interception to start the second half. Yeah, and, go, and going back to the taunting penalty on Matt, like I know there's probably a lot of people that were thinking as soon as it happened, oh, like that, that can't happen, Matt can't do – that's just a reaction from a competitor that got into the end zone that was frustrated that somebody hit him and he just got up and I'm sure he was like, you know, bam, I got into the end zone type thing. And maybe he was looking at him. Yeah, you're right. The letter of the rule, it was the right call, but to kind of how I started the the podcast is I never thought we'd be thinking about Matt Ryan getting a taunting penalty that ends up like you said, maybe doesn't change the complexion of the game, but surely would have helped if they would have got seven points in that situation. So to me, that's just a reaction from a competitor, Dave. That's not something where it's like, dude, he's got to be better in his head or something like that. Well, I, I agree to, with you to a certain extent, but he can't do that. You, yeah. can't, you can't let it happen. I get what you're talking about. I completely concur. I've been in that situation. I've actually been flagged. I was actually thrown out of a game <laughs> because I hit a guy because he hit me illegally uh, in a game. So, I, I understand the emotional part of it. Um, the problem is, is you hurt your team. Yeah. Okay. And yep. and and regardless of whether the officials blew it, which they did, they blew the call. You can't you can't let that happen. Um, just like you would say uh, it about any other player. And so even though Ryan is not the guy you'd put on the picture of a, a guy that's going to do those kind of things, that's going to taunt somebody. He apply it applies to him just like it would to Richie Grant sure. or to to Grady offensive Jared or lineman, whoever. defensive lineman. Yeah, whoever. if you hit a guy out of bounds or got pissed, pissed at somebody and hit took a shot at somebody, you can't let that happen. Yeah, exactly. So, you're right. It, it was missed opportunities and 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 kind of moving forward here, Dave. We talked a little bit about these these turnovers, and I guess here's the thing: as a former player, and Dave, I'm sure you're probably this this way as well. When you come away from a loss, there's only so much that you can talk about positives, Mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, you get paid to win games, right? Coaches get paid to coach games and win. Owners want to win, right? That's just the name of the NFL. But you do have to kind of find a silver lining here and there. And so let's talk about this. I mean, yes, the Falcons ended up losing. Maybe they're still kind of middle of the road when you talk about defense and statistics and takeaways and all that stuff. But they've shown a trend at the end of the season, that when they get the opportunity to get their hands on the football, they're taking advantage of it because it could be a lot worse. These could be balls that are going right to defensive players, and how many times do we see it? Bam, touches the hands straight to the ground. Missed opportunity, huge. But as far as making those takeaways, how are you feeling as far as the identity of this defense becoming a takeaway defense? Yeah, the ball awareness is huge with this team. What, 12 consecutive games now they've taken a football away. And that goes a long way. I mean, what are the what are the, some of the statistics, a couple of statistics that coaches point to? They talk about red zone offense, defense. They talk about third down offense, defense. They talk about takeaways. Mm-hmm. They talk about take. can we get takeaways? Take care of the football. Yep. Atlanta's taking the football away at a really nice clip. And what it tells you is the ball awareness they have, whether they're in zone coverage, the A.J. Terrell interception at the end of the first half yep. where he dives and intercepts the football, the ability of Foye Aluokin to mirror the quarterback as he's trying to get out of the pocket, elevate, bat the ball in Deron Harmon to catch the tip ball. How many times do we have we seen you and I are both offensive guys, you look over the defensive guys are working on the tip drill, keeping the ball alive, tipping it in the air. Yep. Yep. The ball awareness on this team is, is uncanny. It, it's one of those things is that it's hard to teach teams. It's hard to teach players, but when they when t- turnovers start to come, it becomes a bit of infectious where you begin to expect it. You begin looking for it. I think they have that kind of awareness. That bodes well. That moves forward. That carries with yeah. you into the offseason and into next year. Because it, it is. It's one of those, it's one of those confidence, it's one of those belief mechanisms, if you will, that every level of this defense, whether you're a defensive lineman, linebacker, secondary, you go into a game and you're like, we're going to get the football because we've shown that we're going to do And And Foya Luakon, and, and I'll say this about him, he's kind of your more typical like middle linebacker, thicker, bigger pad guy. Like you'd think that Deion Jones would be the guy that's 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 much more graceful. But Foyer, for a big, thick linebacker, has shown some really good hands. Like I've 
seen so many times in my career the ball goes right to these big middle linebackers and they're just not ready for it and it hits their hands and drops to the ground what do they always say that's the reason why they play on defense <laughs> that's right. right that's right but it's impressive to me because you're right dave and we don't know what the roster is going to look like next year we don't know who's going to be back but if that's the identity if that's the belief if that's the confidence that this personnel grouping has that's a good thing to come for this unit they're going to they're going to look back and they're going to say guys just like we did in 2021 you saw how we took the football away we need to do that again to start 2022 whatever it may be those are things that can be talked about in a locker room they can be talked about right before you take the field for a game next year because guys remember it and they have confidence that they're going to make a play so very encouraging even coming up with a loss that they're coming away with interceptions still minus three in a turnover margin that generally not going to get it done for you in a grand scheme of things but the defense doing what they need to do to be an elite turnover unit so Dave let's kind of take a little step back here and let's look at the Atlanta Falcons they still have one game to play but so now we basically have a resume we've got a, a almost a whole season under our belt what is what's to this point, what's your lasting impression of this team that you've seen in the first year under Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith? They compete for 60 minutes. Yeah. I think that that's the thing that jumps out at you. And and, and does that make me warm and fuzzy all over? No, but it, it wins do. Um, does it equate to wins? You hear the adage culture. You hear the adage of, you know, we got to change who we are and, and what we think of one another. Part of that has to do with the turnovers. Mm -hmm. I think that becomes an expectation that the defensive players have. We expect to get turnovers. We're going to create turnovers. That's something that carries over. But I think your mentality of playing 60 minutes and knowing you and I are told it all the time by coaches, and I'm sure fans have heard it a ton of times, there's four or five plays, maybe six plays in a game that are going to dictate how the game will play out. Well, if I play for 60 minutes, I'm going to be in pretty good position to make those plays yeah. when they come. If you've got a team that's a little bit lackadaisical, that doesn't play necessarily the third quarter very well or or whatever it might be, then they miss out on maybe an opportunity or two that might sway the tide or move the game in your direction. I don't think this team will miss that. Now, you know, there's a lot of work to do from a, a talent standpoint to, to build this roster up a little bit more talent-wise in a lot of different areas. But the competitive part of it, you mentioned about Josh Allen, yeah. this team competes. And I think that's not – you think, well, they're pro football players, they should compete. That's not always built into it's the not, DNA. It's not always given. You and given. I played with a lot of guys. And, and so this team competes, and I think that's the thing that jumps out at me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely another positive moving forward um, because you're right. There's certain times that you can watch a game or you can watch it on tape and you can say, they gave up. Like, they threw in the towel. They were done. They stopped competing. And I think that's a really good point. And that's that's something that, uh, you know, if any of those guys end up listening to this, like that might be one of the better compliments that you can get. Yeah, there's only certain things that you can do from an athletic standpoint. You might not be able to jump over 48-inch box <laughs> jump. You might not be able to run a 4 3 five, 40. But if you can compete, like it's all that the coaches always tell you, you can control one thing. It's your effort and your attitude, right? Yeah. And that's what they're doing right now. And, and I wanted to kind of piggyback and go – asked you this is kind of off script Dave there's been so many moving roster things this year with COVID right reserve COVID list guys getting elevated guys coming back down the one thing that I would say that kind of goes back to your compete level is it's this season has provided so many opportunities for guys to get playing time that that normally would not play and I think part of the reason why you're seeing that compete level is the guys that are getting a chance to play understand that they may not get another game. Great point. They may yeah. not get another season. So they're out there going and they're playing their hardest to try to earn space, to try to earn time on the field. And so, yeah, there, you can look at the negative side of it is that the COVID reserve list is taking your stars and they can't play and this, that obviously that's uncontrollable. But you're getting some guys up there that are competing their tails off because they don't know when they're going to get a chance to play again. I think it also, Rack, and I couldn't agree with you more, I think it also accentuates <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what Terry Fontenot has done in, in acquiring guys in season. That's not easy to do now, yeah. especially with the expanded practice rosters and all that kind of stuff. It's not like a guy just walking around the street. It's not a guy driving a UPS truck that be, should be playing a three technique in your defensive line. It just doesn't happen. So how do you find these guys? Terry's done an amazing job with his staff. And then Arthur Smith and his staff, in their development of the players, when they brought them in, Anthony Rush was, not a, was a guy who was on this practice squad near the beginning of the season. Mike Pinnell, another guy. 
big body dudes that they felt like fit the mold of what they were looking for interior defensive linemen, bigger bodies, help with the run game, uh, help you spell some guys, whatever it might be, but a little bit more of an image of what you're, you wanted to look like in the future. Um, they've developed those dudes, so when they plug them in, they know what they're doing. It's not some guy just coming in off the street on Friday and saying, oh, by the way, we're going to line you up in a three and a one technique and just do what Dion tells yeah. you to do. You know, that's not, that's not the way. Yeah. These guys, are they're developing these players. And if if I hang my head on anything about this team, and I know we got another play, game to play, and we'll talk about the Saints here in a few minutes, the coaching's coming back. Yeah. That coaching has been happening all year long, and we're seeing the development of Richie Grant. We're just seeing the development of Ade Ogundeji coming off the edge. Mm-hmm. Um, we're de- you've seen the development of those players on the other side. A.J. Terrell taking another step. Oh, by the way, you got two of the best linebackers in the National Football League that nobody knows about, Deion Jones and Boye Lewick, and yep. tackling machines. Yep. And then the development of some of the guys on the offensive side of the football, whether it's Jalen Mayfield and him coming as that left guard or whatever that may be there. The development of the of the running game to a certain extent. Um, guys having to step up with the absence of Calvin Ridley. And as it turned out in the second half, Kyle Pitts here. The coaching is coming back, people. And that's what I'm most excited about because I see guys getting coached up and being ready to go because this is not the most talented roster in the league. But when you look up, your team's competing. 15-14 at halftime. Buffalo's going to the playoffs. Yep. You're yep. right there with them, you yep. know. And yeah, you got to win those games, and there's there is no you know honorary pat on the back here because this is the National Football League. You win, you lose. But I like the trend, and I love that the coaching and the personnel people are coming back to adjust this team. Yeah, and again, uh, next year, I, you know, again, I hate to kind of transform or move forward to next year, but when the team is officially eliminated, mm-hmm. you kind of think about okay, what are the prospects for the next season? You know hoping God willing that Calvin Ridley's back on the field for Atlanta next year. And we didn't even really get a chance to talk too much about Kyle Pitts. Obviously goes down with the injury late in the first half does tries to go in the second half, but it ended up holding him out. But the phenomenal season that he has had, you get a guy like Calvin Ridley back, you get another year with this offensive line, improving, maybe adding a piece that helps that group out. I mean, you might be talking about having a top three tight end in the national football league. And again, I know we talked last week. He's not really a tight end. He's kind of just a big wide receiver. Yeah, he's a dude is what <laughs> he is. He's just a dude. He's a yeah. ball player. He's kind of like that prototypical. He is just an athlete. Like he's a playmaker. We don't need to put a TE or a WR next to him. We just put a you're ball right. in his hands. Yeah, you write problem next to his name. That's <laughs> what you write. So, uh, you know, he obviously not being available in the second half of the Bills game was 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 an issue. Mm-hmm. Just take another just explosive weapon off the field. Um and it's going to be tough to move the ball against a pretty good team. So you talked about it, Dave. Let's fast forward, talk about this week. Final game on the schedule. And this is one of the cool things about the NFL scheduling model is that they put these divisional games, or ones that they anticipate are going to have meaning at the last week of the season. This one doesn't necessarily have a meaning to get into the postseason for Atlanta, but it's got meaning because it's a rivalry game, and this is a big-time spoiler matchup. So it's like... You know, we've been a part of these Saints-Falcons matchups before, and for a team that's not going to the postseason, I bet they have no problem getting up for this game. Do you agree? Yeah, no question about it. You want to end the season on your terms, on your note. And this has been a pretty good late November through December run for Atlanta, trying to kind of get their foothold for 2022. Well, nothing gets a, a foothold in 2022 like knocking off the Saints and maybe spoiling their opportunity for some postseason. This was a game that the NFL was watching very closely uh, come, come uh, Sunday. Yep. They were talking about um, maybe moving the falcon Saint game to Saturday. Had Atlanta beaten Buffalo, this was going to be a game that is going to have some implications for both teams from a postseason standpoint. And they were looking at it very closely. Uh, now they've they've moved it to 4:25 Eastern time. It still is huge for the Saints, which is lovely for us because you're not going, <laughs> you're not just playing, you know, somebody, you know, a five and eleven team that okay, let's just roll it out there and let's play our last game. This is the Saints, and you got a chance to really ruin their <laughs> off season right here. Uh, so it, it's 
you know, and again, you said Saints. Uh, I love playing against these guys. I love uh, competing. I love the fans and the fan interaction. So this will be fun in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Yeah, it's if if we're not going to the postseason, they can join us as well <laughs> and watch the playoffs yeah. this year. Uh, so we'll see how motivated the guys are. Dave talked about it, and I agree with him. The compete level on this team is there. Uh, let's see it for one more week, and let's see if they can go out there and spoil postseason hopes for the New Orleans Saints and, and end this season on a high note. As you mentioned, it's always easier to go into the offseason with a victory and a smile on your face instead of yeah. that sour taste in your mouth. Well, if you look at this game real quickly, Rack, and, and really a couple of names come to mind for, for the Saints. Number one is Cam Jordan. Cameron Jordan, we have not blocked him since he's been in the league, okay? He's got 22 sacks, I believe, in 21 games or vice versa. He has been – in fact, Matt Ryan's the most sacked quarterback in his career. Now it goes for reason because they play twice a year. Yep. He He's coming off a three-and-a-half sack performance against Carolina last weekend. He has seven sacks in his last three games. Um, this is a guy that now has 106 sacks in his career. He's been a great saint. And he's been a pain in the rear end for the Falcons <laughs> for a number of years. Yes. So Atlanta has got to get him blocked, and he'll be a problem. On the other side of it, we just saw Josh Allen run for almost 100 yards, and they ran for 230 in the game. Yep. Well, here comes Taysom Hill. He's going to play this game at quarterback. It was Trevor Simeon the first time when Atlanta won 27-25 down there. It's going to be Taysom Hill at quarterback. You're going to get quarterback run. Yep. And there's a dude that grew up in this area named Calvin Kamara that loves Calvin to come yep. comes back home uh, from, what, North Cross High School. So yep. you've got two guys that are going to be a problem because you just faced that problem this weekend and you didn't take care of it. Yep. So there's three names for you that you've got to take care of this weekend. Yeah, and, and Taysom Hill is, you know, obviously he's not – as talented as Josh Allen as far as throwing the football, but you're right. Like he's going to watch that tape because Taysom Hill has that compete level running the football as well. He's not the same type of guy that just wants to run and slide or get out of bounds. Like he, he will initiate some contact yeah. sometimes. He's so a tough guy, rough guy. He, he definitely is. And so the, the stopping the run is going to be a challenge and you're right. Cam Jordan, I was going to ask you and, and he's still playing, but is he a hall of famer? Cam Jordan. I think he's there now. Yeah. Yeah. You, you you go over you go uh, triple digits on sacks, uh, and you haunt teams like he has, and boy, he's haunted the Falcons. Well, and it's years. and it's impressive too that he's not as as he's getting deeper into his career. It's not like he's finishing a season with two sacks, right? Right. He's still getting up there close to double digits. Well, he's at he's, eleven and a half now. Yeah, he's he is taking care of yeah. taking over games on many of occasions. So it doesn't look like he's slowing down anytime soon. I'm sure a lot of Falcons fans are going to say. <laughs> ready for retirement <laughs> see if you can get that cold yeah. jacket because we yeah. we would Be like nice. to see somebody else uh so great great little preview there and we'll see if atlanta can slow down jordan on the defensive side and if they can uh slow down Taysom hill and alvin Kamara because those guys will come out ready to compete so that's going to wrap it up here in the falcons audible presented by at&t i think we did a pretty good job without dj we're okay but we we love having shock we with do us, though so he, his smile shock. is infectious yeah. and he definitely brings some good opinions but um you know we we managed we got through this thing well we probably look a little better without Shock's smile right here because he's got that <laughs> golden boy smile doesn't he hey we love you shock we'll see you next week and we'll see all of you guys next week as well again the falcons audible presented by at&t thank you so much for joining us on atlantafalcons.com youtube spotify itunes or wherever you get your podcast material see you next week everybody